Welcome everyone. Welcome to the UBC Learning Circle. I want to tell you a little bit about ourselves uh, before I introduce our guests. Uh, we are the UBC Learning Circle based out of the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health. We are the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people and the UBCLC is generously funded through the First Nations Health Authority. We, are, uh, we feature workshops that focus on the physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional health and wellness of First Nations people. We prioritize First Nations knowledge sharing amongst health professionals, community members, elders, students, and youth. And my name is Aurelia Kinslow. Uh, I am the education coordinator here at UBCLC, and I'm also a PhD candidate in the Faculty of Education at UBC. I'm Cherokee Choctaw, African American, and Scandinavian. Joining us today are Warren Hooley, is Warren Hooley, uh, the founding facilitator, one of the founding facilitators for Indigenize. Uh, he's from the Silks uh, Okanagan Territory in Penticton, British Columbia. Um, he has mixed roots of Okanagan, Irish, Ukrainian, uh, and has grown up in both the Western and, and Indigenous worlds. Uh, Warren brings experience from both sides of his lineage to his work as a facilitator. For the past eight years, Warren has passionately chosen a career of facilitating groups and delivering workshops on the topics of creative facilitation, healthy masculinity, and compassionate communication. We're really honored to have you here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Hello, world. <laughs> Warren Hula here, facilitation geek extraordinaire. Um, let's see. I guess I'll reintroduce myself. Why? Uh, and Jai Squee So Click and Tils and Penticton. I'm from Penticton, the Silk people. Half my blood, my mother. And my other half is Irish and Ukrainian. Cultures that I have yet to explore, but want to as well. I honor both sides of me, where my blood comes from. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, it's. Lovely to be on the uh, Musqueam territory and acknowledging everything that's happened, all the ancestry, all the songs that have been sung, all the dances that have been danced on this territory, the ceremonies, the dreams, everything that's brought us to this point here right now. Um, I honor it and I, I pay my respect. Um, what else can I say about myself? Um, let's see here. I came up with a little bit of a, so this is Indigenized Creative and Technical Facilitation. I'm going to introduce a little, little bit of what that's all about. It's a simple agenda that I came up with. Um, I'm just going to talk about who am I, like I'm doing right now, frame who is Indigenized, what is facilitation. I feel like there's a lot of common misconceptions of what facilitation is. And then I'm going to introduce the creative community model, which is the style of facilitation that we use at Indigenize. And after that, I think I'm just going to open up to questions, and I'd love to hear what people are curious about when it comes to facilitation. So I'm pretty sure you can uh, text and chat mm -hmm. on, a, on an open chat stream, which I'd love some engagement. Um, um, I'm going to try to weave in some creative things if I can off the cuff, uh, because that's what creative facilitation, creative community model is all about. What else can I say about myself? Some interesting facts about me. Um, I am also a beatboxer and a rapper. Um, I tend to do, I tend to bring that in. It's kind of fun. I think fusing the arts with facilitation can bring a lot of life and energy. And uh, you know, it also, especially with youth, can create instant credibility. So I recommend Practicing your beatbox skills, for example, you could. <clears throat> um, what's it make of a beginning beat you could try? You might hear, you might hear uh, youth do this. They do um, boots and cats and boots and cats and boots. It's like boots and cats. So there you go. There's your there's your introduction to beatboxing. Um, <laughs> I recommend you try it out. In puss in boots. <laughs> yeah, maybe do it. Maybe do it by yourself at first. You know, in your bathroom, maybe in the shower. <laughs> Try it in the shower. Um, and if you practice, you'll eventually get to this point where you can do things like this. <clears throat> Introducing. Indigenized. Keep 
practicing kids. <laughs> You'll learn. <laughs> yeah, just take a quick bow here. I'm sure you're, I'm sure everyone's standing and applauding. I'm, I'm positive of that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm a beatboxer, I'm a rapper, um, but I'm also a facilitator, and I've been really, really invested in facilitation for so many reasons. I think if you genuinely are about personal development and personal well-being, facilitation is like in my opinion, the greatest possible career that you can choose for that. Because it, every day you're tested, every day you're in front of a group, you're like, you have to live in the integrity of what you're teaching, and it calls you to the forefront. So if that's something that's interesting to you, um, I would say, you know, but it's also, it's a spectrum. It's like, if you want to be a full-time facilitator, that might be your calling, but it's also, you just want to tweak how you run a meeting in your boardroom. Um, you want to um, um, MC an event better. You want to host an event. You know, all of these skills are so, so incredible. So let me just quickly frame what Indigenize is. So Indigenize started as a car ride between myself and Kelly to Basket. And we realized we had very similar visions of how we wanted to empower our community. We both come from the Okanagan. Um, um, I live in Penticton. She lives in um, um, Costin or Karameas. And I had recently taken this creative facilitation course, creative community model, and I told her about it and she was like, that's exactly what I'm looking for, I want to spice up my facilitation, I want to try some new things. And so she went off, she took the course, fell in love with it, talked to the executive director, brought him back to the Okanagan, and our community loved it too. And that was kind of the beginning. We all sat down after that and we talked about, okay, let's do this. How, how do we make this a real organization? And I would say like Kelly Tabasky is really the one that's championed it. She's like put in the hall the hard work and like made it an organization, um, sacrificed months and months of hard work on very little pay. So kudos to Kelly, wherever you are out there, mm -hmm. for, um, for making this possible. And my role was to really learn the creative community model and become one of the lead facilitators. So that was what I did, and I took training after training after training, which I gotta give a shout out to Partners of Youth Empowerment, Peggy Taylor, Charlie Murphy, Nadia Cheney, for training me, and also Thomas out there, Thomas Ardent and Ruby, all of you really contributed to the facilitator I am today. And, um, yeah, just lim lim, thank you. So Indigenize is a program that is all about using the creative arts and land-based learning to empower communities. I think sometimes people think it's just for youth, but that's completely not true. Even at a youth camp, everyone a part of it completely transforms. Like It's incredible to watch and witness and be a part of. And we also do adult trainings. We do adult trainings on leadership skills, um, reconciliation, on obviously facilitation, and that's kind of what I'm going to cover today. So, what, what could I do here? Could I do something interactive? Maybe I can, uh, ah, like, do we have, is there like a saying of how many people are online? Yeah, uh, 30, 40, 41. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Hello, people. I kind of want to like create some kind of connection here. So, what I'm thinking is, um, we do these creative name games, and typically I would lead this with a group of people, and I'm trying to think, how, how can I apply this on a webcam? So one of the games we do is called um, Name an Adjective, and how it works is the person, you know, you take your own name, so for example, I'm Warren, and I find an adjective that starts with a W, because my name starts with a W. So it would be like, Warrior Warren. Okay, and I, you know, in person you would do the action, you'd be like, warrior, warren, and then everyone would copy it back and be like, warrior, warren, and it's a, it's a memory mnemonic to really sink in. If you can remember warrior, the chances of remembering warren is really, really high, so it really helps the people who um, aren't good at remembering names, which, to be honest, is probably more than 50% of the population. <laughs> um, so I'm going to invite you to, right in the chat stream, come up with your own name. So, Warrior Warren, you know, if your name was Sandy, you might say, uh, <laughs> Sandstorm Sandy. <laughs> or... You get Creative Crystal. 
Creative Crystal. We got we, we got one? Mm -hmm. yep. Ooh, creative. Shout out Creative Crystal. Thanks for participating. Helpful Heidi. Helpful Heidi. Oh, wow. I would hire you in a second. Tornado Tina. <laughs> Tornado Tina. <laughs> Curious Calf. I'll do uh, your body actions for you. If you because people can't see them. Which was next? Curious Calf. Cu cu curious. <laughs> Jazzy Jen. <laughs> Jazzy. Jazz ends. <laughs> <laughs> Jazzy Jen. Mellow Melanie. Mellow. Mellow Melanie. <laughs> well, while people are brainstorming, I'm bringing the mic closer because we have some people who are complaining about sound. But Oh, really? This, this is the mic here? A lot of people have heard you. So, st like, Startling Stella, for instance, or Kind Carla. Wow, I'm loving it. Thank you for participating and texting this in. Fantastic Florence. Fantastic Florence. We got a lot of amazing creative... We got the creative juices flowing. We're going right now. Waking up our brains. And this is what, this is what creative facilitation is all about. It's about engaging the imagination and your creativity in little tiny ways. Um, that slowly builds up over the course of a workshop. Um, thank you for participating. I'm going to try to think of other things I can weave in as I go along, little activities, ways to engage. Um, yeah. So, I want to address this third question here. What is facilitation? Um, I don't think facilitation is taught very often. And uh, commonly when I'm walking around the street, I'm like, People are like, hey, what do you do? I'm like, I'm a facilitator. And they're like, what does that mean? And I have to explain it over and over. So, and this is good for me to do. So, Nadia Cheney, one of my, one of my mentors, um, would always say, ooh, I should write this, but I don't know if that's gonna fit. Here, I'm gonna flip this over real quick. She would say, facilitation is on a spectrum. So let's say the F represents facilitation. <laughs> the T represents training, uh, a, a teaching, like being a teacher. So teaching is essentially what we've been used to growing up. You know, like you're in front of a teacher, they hold all of the knowledge, and for predominantly the whole time, they're explaining and teaching you what you need to understand. And then you memorize what it is, and then you typically write a test. That's like the teaching style. Like you see that in PowerPoints, things of this nature. Um, like right now I'm teaching you this thing. Um, whereas facilitation is fundamentally different. Facilitation, if you were in its extreme form, like 100% facilitation, you would not teach a single thing. You would simply pull out what's already in your group and have them teach each other. Um, you might do that by leading them through an exercise. So you might like lead them through an exercise. So technically you might be teaching an exercise, but you lead them through an exercise and they would have some kind of emotional, um, thoughtful experience. And then you would ask them questions to bring it out and then they would like talk to each other. So that's a facilitator. Facilitator um, doesn't really teach much, um, especially in its extreme form. Now, of course, you can go on the spectrum and even as a, as a creative facilitator, for indigenized, we're probably somewhere around here, typically, where we, um, sometimes we call it a facilitator. trainer. Trainer kind of being a word where, you know, we teach little bits, but predominantly we're trying to bring out the brilliance that's already in the people, it's already in the room. Speaking of brilliance, there's other names that have been coming through, such okay. as Sassy, Shelly, Natural <laughs> Naomi, and can finally hear Kyla. Can finally hear Kyla. Or Kooky Kyla, <laughs> she says. Or Kooky Kyla. I like can finally hear. Like, that's so <laughs> present. It's so like, real right now. I wonder, can, can they hear you speaking? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Maybe someone, someone say, can you hear uh, can, Aurelia speaking? Can you hear Aurelia? In the background, with the yes, voice yes, of God. Yes, yes, okay. yes. The voice of God in the back. The God, the voice of woman. voice of goddess. That's, yeah, yeah, the voice of goddess. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, okay, that's what facilitation is essentially in a nutshell. Um, um, what do you actually learn to do as a facilitator? Is it's a couple things. It's actually a really complicated question. I think about it a lot. But essentially, 
you learn to work with group dynamics. You begin to realize how do groups of people operate and how to um, adjust your language, how to set up containers, how to frame exercises, how to lead them through exercises, how to debrief an exercise, how to have a closing and an opening and have a, an arc for your whole workshop. So a lot of like tangible things that you learn. This is the this is the more technical side of creative facilitation. I just dropped my marker. I got it. Don't worry, I got it. Um, is the more uh, technical side of um, facilitation, whereas the creative part is more the creative community model, which I'll get into after this. Um, so, for example, like something I've really been exploring lately with group dynamics is. Looking at, like, as a facilitator, you want to be super present. And it's taking me actually years to get to the point where I can be present. Um, I think I attribute that partially to my learning style, that I tend to be a memorizer because that's how I learned to do in school. But, um, for example, when I come into a room now, I'm immediately looking at, okay, like, what's the tiredness level compared to, the, like, the high energy? If I have a really high energy group, I'm not going to play an icebreaker right off the bat. I'm not going to do something that's going to increase the energy. It's going to get out of control. So I have to be attuned to the group energy. Um, but if they are really shy, for example, or really tired, then I know I'm going to have to come in with a couple different things that doesn't go from 0 to 10, if they're, especially if they're tired. i got to go from 0 to 2, and then 4, and then 8, and then 10. So I'm going to have to do a couple different exercises to slowly bring them up. So that's a principle of group dynamics and how to work with it. Um, that's just an example of how you learn how it's basically like how do people work how do their brains work how does the psychology work how does their emotional work and how do you use tried and tested skills and, and, and techniques that actually work with them um, I've actually had one person once ask me like Warren like do I really need to learn tra facilitation training like can I just go in there be super present and um, just be myself and do a great job and my answer to her was, yeah, yes, you can do that. And I think there's people who can have good workshops with no training. Um, I kind of use the analogy of a guitar player or a musician, a musician. There's musicians who've never learned musical theory who become really good musicians. They have a lot of natural, natural ability. Um, but they get, to, they get to listen to a lot of music and they have to watch a lot of great musicians and then they emulate and they, they copy it. So if you have watched a lot of great facilitators and you've been around them and you emulate them, I could see how it could work and you could get quite good. But for me, the reason why technical facilitation is so key is it gives you the ability to adjust to any dynamic. So like whatever your room is, whoever shows up in your room, whatever space you're in, all these different things, all these variables are always at play. Facilitation is a crazy, it's never the same twice always got to be present and on your toes and the more technical skills you have and the more they become a part of you the more you can adjust um, to the moment so that's why I'm a really strong advocate for learning technical facilitation and creative facilitation um, is there any questions so far is there any questions any people have any curiosities kind of about what I've said um, knowing that I'm gonna go in I'm gonna introduce the creative community model next but are there any questions? Please use thus the chat far? box for questions. Just like yeah, you yeah. gave use us the chat your box. wonderful names earlier. Type it in. Um, and you, you could ask me any question. You could ask me, like, how do you get your hair to stand up? <laughs> Which is very, very common. I hear that almost daily. <laughs> Natural. But uh, yeah, it can be personal questions, silly questions, actual facilitation based questions if you want to understand. Um, I'll give a couple moments for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Musical interlude. Thoughts are brewing. Do, 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 do. A little beatbox do, do, interlude. All right, time's up. <laughs> okay. They're coming in. They're coming in. Oh, they're coming in. People had. One to person think. said, "Ready to move forward." Um, how do you manage people that dominate conversations? Oh, that's a great that's one. That's a great one. <laughs> I like that question. Thank you. That is a really good question. 
So now that's, I would put that in the category of technical facilitation. Um, let's, let's see if any more come up. I'm gonna, I'll definitely answer that question in this talk. It's really common. Another one I hear that's similar to that, how do I work with resistance? It's maybe one of the most common questions I've ever been asked as a facilitator. How do I work with people who are just like resisting? They don't want to do something or... And I will say the creative community model is like the best approach I've ever seen that melts people's resistance. It's actually, it actually feels like magic. It feels like magic sometimes. <laughs> I have a question. What about for facilitators who struggle with um, being extroverted uh, and who may be uncomfortable with the icebreakers and things like that? Does that happen where some people are just maybe too shy to do something fun and quirky in the beginning? Absolutely. It's the same principle. That's the exact same principle. Um, I'm wondering if I should just, you know, I could use that as a, as a segue into uh, the creative community model. Um, okay. So, here's, here's another one. How to work with those who think they know more than you and aggressive. <laughs> oh my. Oh my. How to work with those who think they know more than you. That's absolutely. Domination, aggression. One yeah. more question. Will you provide insights into whether there are different techniques to be used with indigenous groups versus non-indigenous groups? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, could, I could talk to that for sure. You know, that's actually been funny. That's because we, we got this, we were gifted this creative community model from a multicultural organization, you know, that originally only worked with people in North America. You know, they eventually branched out and they went around the world and they, they actually learned, oh, wow, actually what works with North Americans doesn't work with Brazilians, doesn't work with people from Uganda and the village in Uganda. So they actually learned really quickly, wow, working with indigenous communities around the world, it's not the same. So like, cult there's just cultural differences. Um, so indigenize has had to do that as well. We've had to take the model and like actually work it into who we are as indigenous people. Um, and there's some fundamental things that we've woven in, you know, like we use traditional stories and we, you know, the creative component is the metaphors and the imagery, but we weave that into our traditional stories and we tell stories a lot. Um, metaphor is a huge part of it as well. You know, we do, we have prayers and um, like gratitude circles and there's just a lot of different like nuances. Um, yeah. I would say, but I would say already the creative community model is already a more right-brained, body-engaging, imagination-inducing model, and because of that, it's already considerably indigenous, I'd say. So that's why it works so well, and that's why it's so amazing. I'm not just sitting there talking. There's so many ways we engage, and you stand up, and you slowly start at a low risk level, and you slowly build. So that's a really good example with the icebreaker question. I don't ever do an icebreaker if that risk, if the risk in that icebreaker feels like even a five or higher, and I'm reading the room as being shy or like people, it's, it's like an awkward silence there. I'm, you can't put the risk too high. You got to learn how to start low, um, and that can be really challenging. I mean, I've been in I've been in rural native communities where I'm working with all native youth, and like the shyness level is a ten out of ten and I play my lowest risk games and it's too much for them. And I've had to learn how to even get small. I remember one community I came up, creatively came up with on the second day, I just blew up some balloons. And we just like got into small groups and they just passed the balloon around. And I was like, pass it with your hand at first. And then I was like, now pass it only with your head. You know, non-verbal is key. Non-verbal is key, especially working with really shy native youth. Um, and they started laughing. They started laughing, passing this balloon around. Like, you know, you only use your elbows. And I started laughing, I started, and they started loosening up. I was like, there it is, I finally did it. I found the lowest risk thing I've maybe ever done. Um, but another good example is like, uh, I commonly do this in schools, when I go around the circle, the first circle I'll say, just say your name and do an action with it. So for example, always demo it. Um, I'll say, Warren, and I'll pick something really simple that seems really easy, so like, Warren. <sighs> And then I'm like, now I'm going to invite everyone to mirror that back to me. I'm going to say my name in the action. Ready? One, two, three. Everyone goes, Warren. <sighs> really, it's a mini performance. They're taking a tiny creative risk, 
and every single person gets seen in it everyone gets copied and mirrored it starts to change the energy in the room everyone succeeds um, a lot of laughter tends to come from it that's an example of a really low icebreaker and then you slowly step it up to the next level you slowly step it up to the next level and this is why facilitation is such an art form you need to learn how to field and read your group to be able to know what to put in and you need to learn a variety of different exercises that are at different levels and that takes time, that takes experience, that takes practice. Um, yeah. So the creative community model is based on a modality that Nadia, Nadia refers to. Can you see that better than me? Yeah. So the beginning is imagination. Legible, participation, and commitment. So it's kind of a three part. This is at the heart, and it's not exactly circular there. I can see. Um, doing my best here. Doing my best. <laughs> um, in every single activity we do, you'll see this model inside of it. And that's why Nadia calls it a modality. The first step, like this is important to acknowledge that this is number one. This is number one. That is, we always try to engage the imagination. There's something magical about, and something that brings things to life when you engage someone's imagination. Um, and as soon as you do, what it does is it tends to invite participation. And the more times you can engage the imagination, get successful participation, the people will begin to commit. And they'll begin to trust your leadership as their, as their facilitator. You know, that someone had that question about, like, what if they think they know more than you? Um, you know, when I, as a facilitator, a lot of the times I'm coming in not trying to be the expert, per se, in whatever topic I'm teaching. Um, I welcome anything that's said. That's, that's a more complicated question. I'll get into that later. So invite the imagination, get participation, increase the level of commitment. A lot of programs now, or a lot of people unconsciously, not even realizing it, are trying to get people to participate right away. Or they're trying to get them to commit right off the bat. And you're missing one of the most fundamental steps, which is the imagination. It's engaging the imagination. Um, what's another good example? So like sometimes in, in a check-in circle, after we do the name and action, we go around. Then we'll go around again, and I'll be like, where are you from? And mime something that you like to do. So for example, I'd be like, I'm from Penticton. And you know, depending on the workshop, I might do traditional um, introductions if people want to share, share that. All depends on time, how long my workshop is. And then mime something that you like to do, and I might be like, oh, can I just, what can I do in this half body, body thing? Um, I might go like, Oh, you know, <laughs> right. immediately I'm engaging the imagination again. Again, it's almost like a mini performance. And that one is like hilarious because a lot of times people have misconceptions of what you're doing. Like someone will start going like this. And people are like, dancing. Be like, no, I'm swimming. And like, it's just immediate <laughs> hilarity. Um, yeah. So engage the imagination is kind of the underpinning of the creative community model. Is there any questions about that? Is there any questions connected to that specifically? Yeah. I still want to come back to the other ones that were already already asked. But. What's an example of a traditional introduction? Oh, I, well, I did one at the beginning. Mine's really elaborate because it involves my language. But typically, yeah, like what I'll do is I'll demo it. Anything that you want your participants to do, demo it. It is like demoing is one of the greatest things you can learn to do as a facilitator and it takes the most some of the most practice because you want to demo things in a way that feels accessible that anyone can do like sometimes like I'll say something and people are like oh my god like I mime something like you like to do and they're like what I'm gonna mime something oh my god and then you're like and they're like oh I can do that that's easy so traditional intro I'd say like um, I might go, why, 
Haskell Hub and Jai Squeeze or Click and Dilson Pinkton. That's just me saying my traditional name where I'm from. And then, then I, if I wanted to go farther, I might say in Liut Derohuli Ush in Squee, um, uh, Alain Philip, my, my, my mother and father, and my, my grandparents, um, Abe, Paul, Twee Timson Chai, this is a traditional name, and um, Agnes Tilhiza. That's what I would say if I were to like. And then, like, I just, boom, I demoed it. For example, you don't need to, and I might even say, you don't need to know your language, but if you want to name those things, great. If you have a traditional name, share it. You know, no pressure. Let's go around. Um, and sometimes that can take quite a long time. Like, you, you, it has to be typically a longer workshop for that to work. And also, like, if everyone already knows each other in the room, that might not be necessary. If I'm the only one that doesn't know people, it's probably just ideal that I do my long traditional intro and then they don't. So again, it's like every choice you make as a facilitator is based on the dynamics of what is present in the room. And that takes practice. It takes a lot of practice. <sighs> it's getting hot in this room. It's getting hot. <laughs> cool off. I need like one of those little mini fans. <laughs> We're like, can we get a leaf? Can someone get a leaf? <laughs> um, okay. Was there any other questions that were there that I didn't answer, or I'll circle back to you? You've answered other other questions, I think. Yeah. I think I should flip the phone just because we're running out of room. So the other one, I've already named this, but I find that this even just this graphic is helpful. Um, this is slowly building risk, right? So if, if, if this step, if this first step was the name in action, like I said, Warren, everyone copies it back. And then this was mime something you like to do. Right? Then this might be my first icebreaker. My room is really quiet. And awkward, I might have to do, I might even have to do one more. Like I did that just yesterday. I had to do four in a row because the room was so, I don't know, they were just so like kind of shut down. They were like university students, um, which I didn't expect at all. I actually came in there not even planning to do that. And then I was like, whoa, okay, I can read it. It's awkward, it's silent. I need to keep doing this until we like, we start opening up and we can actually have a good conversation. If you need to have people to participate and talk in your workshop, the investing in this is huge. Like it's worth it. It's worth opening them up. Um, otherwise, you're gonna be talking pretty much the whole time at them. Which, if you're teaching, that's fine. If you're trying to facilitate, that's not ideal. You want to bring the you want to bring it out of the participants. So, Tornado Tina had uh, <laughs> asked about other examples of engaging the imagination, and you're 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 giving some right now. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see if I can describe one more. So, a typical icebreaker we'll use, they're really, they're really intelligently designed and they've evolved over years. So, the, probably the most classic one that I love is called You're Awesome, or some people call it Walk Into the Circle. And how it works is you get people into groups of like six or eight, and each person takes um, their turn walking into the center of the circle. Um, and you have to demo this again. You have to demo it in a way that feels accessible. So when I demo it, I'll be like, okay, so if I walked in a circle, it can be as simple as you like. It could be like this. And I just like walk into the center. Then you move my finger. Um, and, then, and then I walk back up. And then everyone copies me. Everyone copies, again, mirroring. Mirroring is a big part of the creative community model. Everyone walks in copying my walk. They turn to me and they say, Warren, hey, Warren. You're awesome. Now, if you wanted to add a traditional component, you could use language, language of that place, like white Warren, Tali uh, Chast. That's what we'd say in Okanagan. Um, so, there's always modifications you can do to pretty much any English part. So, if you look, if you break down that exercise, like what, why does it work so well? A walk. Anyone could come up with a walk. There's no wrong way you can do that exercise. Like I've had people walk in like. And they're like kind of like pissed, like pissed off youth. 
And they're like, they walk in the center and they walk back out and they're mad and then everyone copies them and like we all just burst out laughing. Like it just <laughs> breaks their walls down. It's hilarious. So you, A, you can't fail. B, people immediately mimic you. So it's like, it, in a way it kind of tells you what you did is okay. Whatever you did is okay. And then people immediately turn to you and say, you're awesome. So you know, no, whatever, what are you going to do? You're going to get positive reinforcement. And acceptance, right? And acceptance. Mm -hmm. So it's like an amazing exercise that unconsciously starts to create an environment where you are going to be accepted, you're going to be supported. And then like you can talk about it if you want. Like after you've done the exercise, be like, okay, how's everyone feeling? You know, you do the little debrief. Um, how have you changed? You know, why is it exercise? Why did that exercise work so well? What did we do? Yeah. So let's set that intention. Let's set the intention to create an environment where we celebrate each other. We accept each other. It's okay to take creative risks. Let's do that together. We have that power to make that choice. And then you could even weave that into the community agreements that you do. You can segue into the community agreements. What else do we want to do together as a group today? What's really going to make a really good environment for us to be in? You know? Segways and transitions is a lovely, lovely part about facilitating that I joke about all the time. <laughs> um, yeah. Another, okay, what was, what was some of the other questions that were said? Uh, you had uh, examples of engaging imagination, traditional introductions, uh, what if people are reluctant and don't know each other, ideas to introduce themselves or people to each other in those cases. There's a couple, what was it, the ones like working with difficult uh, or dominating? Or yeah, not? dominating conversations, aggressive, and those who think they know more than you. Okay, dominating conversation, let's start with that one, because that illuminates some other key components. So, there's two different things about it. There's actually a lot of techniques. Almost anything in facilitation, it's like, it's accumulative. Like, I, I can teach you one little technique now, and you can, one at a time, you can apply this technique and learn it and kind of get it. But then, it's actually like, when it comes to like working with people in conversations, I'll do like five things over a span of an hour that sets it up for it, if that makes any sense. There's a lot of little techniques that all add on top of each other. Um, what's a really good example? So one of, the, one of the things I teach is healthy masculinity to young boys. And if I start talking about like Me Too or like any oppression women have faced, it can be really common that some boys get really defensive and they start, it, debate, debate mode gets kicked in. Um, and they, and then they're basically dominating the conversation with their, like, their will and their opinion. Now that can be different, that's like a more charged version. There can also just be people who are really unaware of how much space they take up and they just talk a lot. And like they're totally innocent, they don't realize it, that's also extremely common. Um, I think with both scenarios, I use the same skills. I use the same techniques. Um, one is in the community agreements. You can call this many things. Oops. Community agreements. I just sometimes just call it requests. Here's the requests I'm making of you, you know? Um, so community agreements. And you might make an agreement like, uh, like one's called step up, step back. Step up, step back. Like if you know your group, if you like, if you're doing like a board meeting and you know there's people in your group that tend to talk a lot, um, this could be a great thing to like. You, I call it front loading. You front load what you need to say to set people up to succeed. It's a lot harder to be like called out in the moment, and be like, hey, you know, you could, uh, I'm gonna teach you skills of how to do that in a harmonious way, an effective way, but it's a lot better to like, give them pre-warning and like set them up for success. I see people walking by. <laughs> hey, BBC people. <laughs> um, it's a lot better to set them up for success and then I think that minimizes any kind of embarrassment that can potentially happen which is a part of humanity, you know, we, you know, but 
Uh, it's also an incredible opportunity because we all make mistakes and we all have blind spots. And if you can learn how to um, engage with someone in that moment and, and, and make them feel accepted and okay about it, that's a beautiful thing. You're demonstrating amazing things in that moment. So they're both incredible and they both take a bunch of little mini skills. So step up, step back is you frame it to your group. Like, okay, so if you're someone who tends to be quiet, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll acknowledge I'll see that this is another thing. So inside of agreements is another technique, and it's oh, can you see right there? This is called um, acknowledging resistance. Acknowledging resistances. Make resistances. So ignore the one. Um. I might say things, sometimes it's resistances and sometimes it's like, um, sometimes it's like, can you see that? Like society, society dynamics. Oops. That's kind of weird. Yeah, I'll try to explain it. But I'm basically just acknowledging things. Like the more someone can feel like you understand something and you're aware of it, I think the more the person relaxes. And this is the thing, is you can't just acknowledge this and not know about it. You actually have to learn about these things. It has to be real, it has to be authentic. So that people can feel it's not authentic. So for example, if I'm doing a step up, step back agreement to my group, I might say, you know, I'm gonna acknowledge that you probably already have group, of group dynamics in this room. If I'm in a classroom, like some of you probably have probably never really spoken in class. That's probably true, and some of you probably speak all the time. That's probably already happened. You know, everyone's like, knows that's true. So, and then I'd be like, and what I want, for those of you who maybe don't speak as much, I will really, really encourage you to share your voice today. Even if you speak a little bit more, we really want to hear your voices. And you can like sell that if you want. You can say like, you know, you can even ask the group, why is it important that everyone we hear everyone's opinion. Why is that important? Right. See, like, again, in every moment I can either ask a question and get the brilliance from the group like a facilitator, or I can teach something um, like a teacher. Right? There's more options than that, but those are the two main ones. So in this context, I might say, yeah, why, why is it important for, to hear everyone's opinion in a room? How does that benefit us? What's the benefit of that? And you might hear some answers, and then sometimes I might even add on top and say, well, you know, in my culture, we have something called a naukin, right? And I use terminology and concepts from my culture. This is how we indigenize it as well. Um, a naukin. A naukin literally kind of, well, sort of translates to actively pursuing the opinion that's the most opposite of yours because it is our diversity that makes us strong. Now I'm like moving into like almost like motivational speaker there. There's a lot of roles a facilitator can play. That one right there, that's a little bit of a motivational speaker angle. Like connecting people to like the brilliance and the, the power. If we, if, we, if we decide to speak up, we all learn more. It's our differences that makes us stronger. In the society we live in right now, again, I'm acknowledging society, society we live in now doesn't celebrate diversity. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up in high school, like when I was different, I got made fun of. And that, that trauma doesn't go away. That stays in your body. So how do we change our environments? We have to actively put it, attention and energy into changing it. If we want to decolonize, we want to re-indigenize, it takes di like, direct energy. We have to acknowledge how we were raised, and we have to do something different. And this is a really good example. Now, uh, uh, and then, <laughs> like now I'm already hearing in my own mind. I might say, you know, and you might be an introverted person. You might love listening more. That's great. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I still want to hear your voices. We want to hear everyone's voice. And then I'll go to the next one. So that was pretty long. I don't know if I'd talk that long on it. You don't want your agreements to be super, super long. But if that was a really, really important one, I would spend time on it. Step back. Step back would be if you tend to talk a lot. If you tend to be a really, really... You tend to share a lot and you're really open and confident. That's amazing. I'm so happy. I wish, I wish all of us were comfortable to speak freely. 
And we got to be aware, the less we speak, the more we hold space, it allows the people who might be more introverted, the people who take a little bit longer to speak for their voices to rise up. And again, then you connect it back. That's why it's, then we hear all the voices, then we hear all the differences, and then we all grow more. So if we're just kind of hearing one opinion, one viewpoint most of, most of the day, we're not getting that diversity of thought, diversity of perspective. So that's something I might do. Um, that's like a, that's a front load technique, I would call it. You're front loading to set them up for success. Then you go into like, say, a conversation. Now you're in the conversation. I'd remind this right before I do it. So remembering, step up, step back. We're about to go into a conversation, really inviting people who are step back, step up. Really just set them up, say it again, remind them, right? Because they've probably done a bunch of things and their energy has changed and they're thinking of what they just did in the activity. So remind them again. Then you're in the dialogue, you're in the dialogue. And then a, a big way that I do it is I do it by hands. So yeah, like raise your hand if you want, if you want to speak and, I'll, and I'm going to do my best to really equally spread out. Let them know what you're actively trying to do. I'm trying to get as many voices in the room. So there might be a time where you put your hand up and I might not call on you right away, especially if you've spoken two or three times already. I might look somewhere else first. Um, or I might wait 10 seconds for the introverted people to raise their hand. Right? Letting them know, being super transparent and open about what I'm doing. Um, super helpful. And then there's, you know, there's a, I think there's a rare moment when someone is literally in the act of talking and they're talking and talking and talking and talking. And I might have to interrupt. It's pretty rare that I do that. Um, because, I th because I think I talk about this so much, people are pretty aware of it. But uh, on a rare occasion, if I have to be like, hey, can I just pause you for a quick sec? And I'll, first thing I'll say, what do I genuinely appreciate about what they're doing? Like, <laughs> the funny thing is, if you're getting triggered because they're taking up a lot of time, and that comes through in what you're saying, it's probably not going to go well. So it's, it's a tricky thing. It's a tricky thing. So I think the earlier you can say it, the better. Like, the more judgment you have in your mind towards them, the trickier it's going to be. Honestly, as a facilitator, that's why I say it's such a personal growth career is because you have to learn to work with all of your own judgments. Like the more neutral you can come into a room and just accept people for where they are completely, the better facilitator you become. <laughs> and that takes, that, takes, that takes a lot of personal growth. That takes a lot of working with like elements of trauma, of judgments that you have about different people. It's no joke. Like it takes energy and, and, and time um, but for example if someone's talking a lot I can just be like okay okay I'm like oh, hey can I interrupt you for a quick sec okay so I love I love the passion I love like how much you're into this how much you're talking about it like that's awesome like can we give some snaps for that like get the whole group to give some snaps and I also want to just remember like I really just looking at the time I want to like balance hearing you and what you have to say and um, also hearing other voices in the room or getting to other activities or whatever I'm going to say. So um, are you open to like maybe taking a couple, talking for a couple more sentences but wrapping up what you're saying? And the person's like, okay, you know? And like, you know, this is, what I'm saying is like, it, it's kind of an advanced skill. Like this is a lot, that's a lot of words to say. And it, but it takes practice. It really takes practice. And I know, I almost feel like right now, I'm like, okay, I'm saying a lot. And I hope, I hope I'm introducing a lot of concepts to you. You might not fully be getting these and like you're going to immediately apply them in your life. I hope so. I hope you practice them. But honestly, in a webinar context for me, a lot of this, and you, you can also, I think you can download this video and you can watch it again. But for me, a lot of this learning has to be done in person, a lot of it. So part of my goal today was to inspire you and feel like, okay, wow, I'm getting an idea what it's, what facilitation is. I'm getting an idea what these tangible techniques are. And I, you know, I'd love to see you in person. I'd love to see you come in and like work with you. That's probably the most proficient way to train a facilitator is in person. Mm -hmm. You had, uh, there was someone who uh, asked if there's, uh, if you recommend any training for the courses or readings and I know Absolutely. that uh, Indigenize does do trainings and you want to tell us a bit about it? Mm -hmm. What time are we at too? I feel like I'm talking a lot. We're, we're on time, okay. I like to talk about facilitation, let's just put it that. <laughs> <way>. <laughs>
I can be like super tired, almost about to go to bed, and then someone asks me a facilitation question, and I'm like, what'd you say? <laughs> Just like, blah, 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 blah. that's a good sign. It's a good sign that you're doing something you love. Um, yes, so I guess I'll come to the page. I mean, I'll just write it down, but I think it, it'll be in the chat stream as well. So it's just the word indigenized.com. Um, are people who are watching this both like native and non-native? Yes, I think so. Okay, so indigenized.com is where you would go for like our indigenous trainings that have much more of indigenous focus and elements like that. But in general, um, there's also Pi Global, which is more geared towards um, like multicultural. And they do trainings in Vancouver. I think they mainly do trainings in Vancouver and Seattle. But they're, they're an international organization, so they do it in big cities. Um, sometimes there's a Canadian branch of this that does it in Victoria that I lead. I co-lead, so that also exists. Um, I'm not sure when the next training will be though, so I would look to these two first. These are the first ones I would look for. Yeah, and there's also a lot of really great resources on Pi, Pi Global, so irregardless if you're indigenous or not indigenous, there's a lot of really cool resources. You can look at like icebreakers, and they have songs, and they have um, exercises, just a whole plethora of things um, in their toolkit. If you go to the website, there's a little toolkit tab. Um, there's also training tabs in both of these websites to look at dates and things that are upcoming um, with both. Yeah, hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, and there's someone asking about uh, the land-based component of what hmm. Indigenize does. Oh, that's a great question. So, we've had the absolute pleasure of actually having another model influence us. So um, um, Kim King has come in and been a part of Indigenize, and she comes from a background called Rediscovery Camps. And Rediscovery Camps are like, you know, week-long minimum. Actually, no, I think they're like three weeks or something. Like, it's a long program, and they youth camps, and they, they bring them out into the woods, and they just do land-based exercises. And a lot of it um, that I've been introduced from Kim is about like reactivating like our indigenous capabilities. And it's really exciting because um, it makes you feel like you almost have superpowers. Like I don't know if people heard stories about you know why they drafted native people into the Vietnam War, for example. Like they were known to have incredible skills of navigating any nature area. Um, that was a huge reason why they were drafted. Um, and so those skills, those like six senses or and beyond, like she'll ask this question, she'll be like, how many senses do we have? And people will name the five, five senses, right? She's like, what if I told you there's 12? And then she starts to explain some of the other ones. And some of the ones that we had as indigenous people for thousands of years and that we've, because we're on technology and because we're living in houses and we're not in nature, we've, we don't really necessarily use them anymore. So they've, they've slipped away. They've, it's like the ability is inside you, but you need to reawaken it and you need to develop it again. Um, so, you know, we play, and it, a lot of it's in the form of games. So we'll play games like Deer Ears, which is a really fun one, um, where one person's in the middle. We, it's usually in the middle of the woods. It's, it's ideal when, like, there's cracking sticks and stuff that you're stepping on. Um, someone puts, like, we'll actually give them, like, antlers, like, from tree branches. They wear a blindfold. They put their antlers on and they have a tail, um, which is used like a piece of cloth. They sit in the middle and then there's a group of wolves that go all around. So it's usually like 10 people-ish surround, you know, pretty far away, like, you know, a solid 50 feet away. And then you say, wolves howl and all the wolves go, Arr! and then like wolves hunt. And then they, their job is to sneak in without like making too much noise and get close enough to the deer to steal its tail. But what the deer has to do is use all of its skills to be able to like sense where the wolf is and then point at it. And they just say starve. <laughs> and if they can if they can get guess right, like it's kinda of like a person who's like a moderator, and if they see like, oh yeah, you got him, 
then um, the person's out of the game. But it's really cool. Like I think the more you play that game, the more, yes, you're using your ears, which is one of your n normal five senses, but I think there's also other senses you can start to cultivate in that exercise. You can start to get a sense of like depth perception and like energetic recognition, um, which is super cool. And it's like exciting. And also, I believe a skill that we've really lost um, as indigenous people. So as an example of like a land-based learning activity that we do, um, and I honestly, hope. the kids just love it. I hope Everyone you do those for it. adults. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Not I've, just for kids. I've played <laughs> that game with adults, and it was like the most elaborate, incredible version of the game. <laughs> I had one guy who, like, even when he came back, or sorry, that's a different game. We also play a game called Greet, Greet the Tree, where, like, you partner up, one person gets blindfolded. Let's say I'm with Aurelia, and I lead Aurelia around, and I kind of, like, try to trick her, and I really all in circles, and I eventually bring her to a tree. She gets to know the tree. And it's like we really invite people to get to know know it on a different level. Like don't just don't just like use your logical mind to figure out what it is. Try to use other parts to have a conversation, have a relationship, feel the energy, you know? And then I would try to trick you and I try to bring you back and like mess you up and then you I take off the blindfold. And then you have to go find your tree. Mm -hmm. And most people, you know, they go and they, a, a lot of youth especially, like, they'll, like, like cheat or, like, use some kind of, like, they'll, like, break a branch off and then know it's going with the broken branch or something, which is fun and it's fine. But I really try to encourage them, like, use the different senses inside you. And one time I had an adult man, when I brought him back, he didn't take off his blindfold. Mm -hmm. He tried to find his tree completely blindfolded, just completely using his, like, sixth sense or whatever sense you want to name it and it was amazing he got like 90 percent towards this tree and then like last second i think my theory is because of fatigue like he just couldn't sustain being in that state and then he totally went off and was like went the complete wrong direction wow. he was so close um i was really inspiring and i was like wow i want to play this game more often because yeah. that's really really cool <laughs> so this is some examples of the land-based learning that can be interwoven um into some of the creative um, ex exercises and um, I think it just speaks to the decolonizing and re-indigenizing of I honestly believe all human beings but you know our primary focus is indigenous youth like of Turtle Island even more specifically we focus on BC that's where we're, our mandate it is, is to focus on BC um, and you know we take some contracts outside of that but for the most part yeah. What was the name of the, the training for youth that uh, the, the woman you mentioned just did? Oh, it's not training. It's just like a camp. The camps, yes. Yeah. Redis rediscovery camps. Okay, nice. Yeah. Well, so it's rediscovery camps, um, indigenize. I think this summer we have three different youth camps, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. This might not be set in stone, but we have one in the Okanagan. It's Okanagan. We have one that's a confusion camp between multicultural and, and, and indigenous youth mm -hmm. and we have one that's like uh, more rediscovery based land based and it's out like out in the woods mm -hmm. so we have three different camps from from what I know and you can probably see that online like all of it will be on this website and you can you can take a look at it nice. there was one question uh, earlier from someone who says that they have a client who has had children apprehended and now has to attend life skills workshops to show how they can deal with something like conflict. Mm -hmm. But they are angry and bitter uh, with having no choice of participating. So that links into their question about um, how do we deal with resistance and anger, I guess, in facilitation. You know, that's an interesting question. I mean, I've learned, I'm an active learner of many fields, and that would actually step outside of what I've learned in facilitation specifically, and it would start entering like conflict resolution, mm -hmm. which is definitely like if I'm a lead facilitator of a youth camp, you can use a lot of the same facilitation skills. It all kind of stacks on top of each other, they all work together. But when it comes to like if someone's in a triggered state, to me, nothing works better than um, like emotional regulation, some like empathy. Like I, the the version I use is nonviolent communication. It's a really cool model for helping name 
the emotions that are there and naming what that means about what's really important to them. And there's something about that process that's even now scientifically proved through interpersonal neurobiology, which is a really big, really big fancy word, but it basically just is proven to calm the nervous system. So when you're fight or flight or freeze or faint, it calms it back to normal. So if these people are struggling by going into fight or flight and then fighting because of it, um, learning self-regulation tools is is the most important thing that can possibly learn. And this is the thing is no one's learning this. Like I've traveled, I don't know how many schools. I did not learn this at all growing up. Learning how to regulate your own nervous system is like non-existent. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even yourself, you might have some techniques that you even have as an adult, but chances are there's probably more learning you could also have. And the more you can learn those skills and more you can learn to regulate yourself, the more confident, the more able you're to teach someone else. Um, so that would be more my recommendation in that scenario is probably learning some some kind of emotional regulation technique and being able to teach it to that to that person like breathing is the most obvious one that I would imagine is even in that life skills program breathing is the simplest one easiest to learn but also it's not at the top of the list of the most effective naming your emotions and all the different emotions you have and your body sensations is the highest out of the studies that are done recently is the highest, most effective way to calm. Um, yeah, there's other there's other techniques too. There's assertiveness training can also really help with conflict resolution. And again, so this all weaves in, they all weave in together to make you a dynamic full facilitator. And this is why I say again and again, facilitation is a personal development lifestyle. Like it really takes, you need to be a really kind of holistic lead. Uh, healed and trained human being to really be able to address all the dynamics that comes up in community. You're holding space for a group of dynamic people who are going to have coming from traumatic events and have limiting belief systems and um, have conflict within each other. Like that's just a reality. And if we want to change that, if we want to, if you have the passion to really work with that, it's going to take some energy. It's going to take some practice. But honestly, I think there's nothing more worth it. There is nothing more worth it. We are at a time, we are at a time in history where I think more people than ever are waking up and becoming ready for these kinds of conversations, ready for these kinds of skills, but we don't have enough facilitators who can actually bring them through it. We just don't, there's a, there's a calling for that, so. I mean, honestly, if you're, if indigenized intrigues you, if you want to like even become an indigenized facilitator, this is something that calls you in, please come call us, check us out. Like, like right now, indigenized is getting more con contracts and more bookings than we can handle. Like I, I can't, I mean, me and Kelly can't do them all, or like the very limited, limited number of facilitators we have. So I'm, I'm putting a call up. What? How many facilitators are there? I mean, we kind of have a few that are like, side facilitators that that and that number can fluctuate based on if they've moved away or if they had a kid or yeah but there, i'd say there's like a base level like maybe four of us oh okay yeah like we're like the main people and then we have like a and a pool of other mm -hmm. but we're looking we're always looking we want more and like people who are you know there's different levels if you just want to learn a little bit more to bring it back to your community great if you want to like really learn this skill and even become an indigenous facilitator also great. Um, we invite both massively. Great. What time is this go to? Well, it's uh, till 11.30, but for oh. questions as well. So it's now 11, uh, almost 10. If you want, we can invite questions or... Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm. All right. So if, if uh, any of the participants want to ask uh, some questions on any of the information that was shared, please, we're all ears, please use the chat box. All lies, indigenous. <laughs> it might even be nice to do something creative again. Yeah. I feel like my energy is kind of like <laughs> talking a lot. It kind of goes against me to be actually speaking this much. Okay. It's tricky for me because I don't yeah. typically talk so much. It's usually like talk a little bit, do something. Talk a little bit, do something. Mm -hmm. um, it gives, makes an energy feedback rather than just. I'll yeah, put, right? exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, hmm. 
We have some questions streaming in, if we can give them a few seconds. Uh, we have the first one that says, did we go over create the creative community model? Yes, we did. A little bit, a little bit. We so, can say a bit more. Maybe. Well, I'll just like remind you, I felt like I said a lot of things, so I totally understand that question. So the creative community model is this, it's the imagination participation commitment that's like the modality inside the whole thing and then one of the main aspects of it is the escalation of risk over time so that's like the main components of the creative community model there's like oh so many more components to it actually you know what if you're really interested in it and you want to learn it on its own there is a book about it let me write that one down there is a book called catch the fire By Peggy Taylor. Catch the Fire by Peggy Taylor. That's this like really can explains in depth what the creative community model is. It has like over a hundred activities or something in it that you can use. Um, and that's just some really cool stories of it, like, uh, like success stories of how incredible the model is. Um, let me give you an example myself. So the first camp I ever went to was in the summer of 2013. And I came in as like kind of a young, not really that well-trained facilitator, but I was like really like energetic and like really, I don't know, like I was all about like laughter and playing fun games. And I came into this environment with 20 other facilitators and some of them super experienced and super talented. I remember feeling like really kind of like, oh man, like I really don't know what I'm doing. Like when I watched how they facilitated, I was like, wow, like they're so, Incredible. So inspired, but I was also a little intimidated. And there was about five or six youth at that, native youth at that, um, at that camp. It's an eight-day camp on Cortez Island called Power of Hope. So if you're a multicultural youth or native youth, you can send them to that camp. Um, I'm just writing thing after thing here. Um, Power of Hope. I think it's .ca, the Canadian one, and there's a .com for American one. It's near Whidbey. It's on Whidbey Island. So I'm on this camp, eight day camp. There's about, I think, six native youth, and they're all like cousins. They're all like close, to, like either brothers, sisters, or cousins, and they were super shut down. Like I'm not kidding you. In four days, they didn't. I don't think they participated in barely any activities. They just sat on the sidelines. It was hard for me, it was hard for me to, because I knew I wanted them to be a part of it so bad. Um, and on the fourth day, I was sitting in the main hall when all of a sudden I heard this voice singing. And I was like, who is singing a traditional song? And I was like looking around the room, looking around the room, and sure enough, I zeroed in and I seen this girl, and her name was Mary. And I got down off the structure and I walked up to her. She was singing really quietly this traditional round dance song. And I was like, whoa, like it was really good. And sure enough, she ends, a one youth is like, oh my gosh, Mary, you're an amazing singer. And another youth is like, you should totally sing that in front of everybody. Um, and Mary had this like shock look on her face. And then she like kind of took this breath and then she looked right at me and she said, if you come stand beside me, I'll do it. And I was like, okay. I wasn't even sure if she really knew I couldn't tell if there was any connection between us, but I, I had sung a traditional song at the beginning, so I thought I was modeling and I was giving permission for it. Sure enough, fast forward a couple hours later, we're standing in front of the whole group, and you know, there's like 80 people or something. She pulls out a drum, she starts to hit it, dun, 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 and she starts singing. And I really thought she was going to be just as quiet and as uh, shy she was in the in the... In the, hall, in the dining hall, but she started singing and she just like full voice, like longhouse voice, just like, oh my gosh. And it was just like, I felt like I had the, this beautiful privilege of witnessing this girl who's been shut down her whole life, you know, from, you know, all the things that native youth have experienced from intergenerational trauma. And I felt like for the, maybe for the first time she broke out of her shell. And I could see her just like, her pride and her confidence and her, 
just shining through. And all of a sudden, all of her siblings and brothers got off the edges, and for the first time, they joined the circle. And they taught us this like traditional dance that went with the song. And it was like the first time everyone was engaged in four days. And it was one of the most incredible moments I've ever witnessed in my life. And I knew in that moment, I was like, if this model can bring out these, this level of shutdown youth, this is what we need. This is it. Like, this is what I want to dedicate my time to. This is what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to become a lead facilitator one day. I'm going to bring this to Indigenous communities. I knew it. I knew it in my heart in that moment. And every day since that day has been like direct track to that. And yeah, now I'm leading, now I'm co-leading camps, both for powerful, multicultural, and both indigenized. And it's an absolute gift. It's like one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me. You know, I found a purpose, I found a path, and I've walked it knowing where I want to get to. I think that's why it's, it's so important. So that's an example. That's an amazing example of how powerful this model is and how much it can, can transform um, not only the youth, but also the adults involved. Again, like I'm saying, you have to grow so much to be able to even hold that space and to be able to take people through these activities. If you're like shut down with your creativity and you have a bunch of uh, inner critic that you can't draw and you can't sing and you, and you can't do theater, you know, that's gonna come out, right? We can't even be positive role models if we still all have that. And you know, that's okay, hold, hold ourselves with care and allow ourselves to put ourselves in the environments where we get to grow too, but you know, if you want to be that role model, we have to be willing to like take risks and be uncomfortable. You know, that's just a part of life. You've got to be willing to get uncomfortable. Um, and go at your own pace. You can go at your own pace. And that's totally fine. But, yeah. But that's my what message. I also really liked about your story is that how you, a group can seem shut down for three days, four days, and actually you're planting seeds and they're, they're, what you're doing is actually doing a lot for them. Um, and as demonstrated by the, the, the last part with everyone, uh, with, with, the, with Mary singing and, and her siblings mm -hmm. dancing and the, the sharings, they just needed a bit of time to open up and show how much they have absorbed. But it was completely working, even though at first Absolutely. it may not seem like that. So Absolutely. that's a really good story. I think like that's an attest, that's an attestment to how much consistency and like repetition that some people need to feel safe. Mm -hmm. They need to be like shown over and over, like it took them four days of being like, yeah, okay, they're doing the same things every day. People are constantly celebrating when someone takes a risk. Mm -hmm. They're seeing it, they mm -hmm. see it all, and they're witnessing it for a long time. Mm -hmm. And eventually they're like, okay, I think I'm ready. Like, this feels safe to me. Like, mm -hmm. that's how much yeah. it took for them, which yeah. is a lot more than most people, but. Yeah. That's what our, because of what our youth go through, that's what they need. Mm -hmm. um, and it was working. <laughs> yeah, totally. And by like that, then that, like after that song she sang, like she was just like, it's not like she just went back to being shy. It was like, she's laughing and making everyone laugh. And she was probably acting the way she does with her best friend, but now she said, did it with everybody. Mm -hmm. That's what I would imagine. Yeah. And same with her siblings. It was amazing. I was just like, this is it. Mm, so cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> So we got a lot of really wonderful comments. Thanks for the great webinar. Uh, empowerment is awesome, and recognizing our ways is so great. Imagine it, imagine it is there. We have it. Stunning. Uh, this has been awesome. Uh, we do have, um, we have a little bit of time for other questions. We we have one person who's asking, um, how do you refocus? or bring back the attention of a group after an activity where everyone is talking and not focusing on the facilitator. Yeah, yeah, that, that's great. That's, okay. This is a really good tangible skill um, that is so important. If you don't want to wear your voice out and just like lose your voice or just put so much energy pulling the group back in, there's two main things. One, talk about it in your agreements, right? In your community agreements, have like, I call it bring it back in. Bring it back in. There's going to be times where, you know, you're front loading. There's going to be times where I really need you to come back in. Like, it can be so draining as a facilitator to have to keep calling back in. Like, are you cool with that? Can I get a thumbs up? Like, you actually get a little mini agreement from every person. Like, you're setting them up for success. Then when the actual moment comes, there's a couple things you can do. 
One, the most classic, and you might have seen it before, is just like, clap once if you can hear me. Everyone claps. Clap twice if you can hear me. Clap three times if you can hear me. That's probably the most effective, best overall, especially if it's a really large group. That one works so well. It's something about a clap that just like creates silence afterwards um, and pulls attention. Um, but there's other ones that I find that are equally effective um, in different contexts, but you have to teach it first. So if you're going to do like a hush fell over the crowd, or if you're going to do um, the hand connected to a string on the bottom of your chin, you have to show them first. So be like, okay, everyone, now that I have your attention, I'm going to teach you a technique of how we can come back to attention. So for example, I might say, and then a hush fell over the crowd. And when you hear someone say that, and you hear, then we all say, hush. And if you start to hear hush, because maybe you don't hear it at first and the way it comes to you, as soon as you hear the person beside you, you say it too. Let's practice it. Everyone start talking. Uh, and then you're like, and then a hush fell over the crowd. Hush. Right? They get the feel in their body. They know what it feels like to do it. Setting them up for success. The other one is the um, hand connected to a string on the bottom of your chin. So you're like, everyone start talking, talk, talking. And then as you raise your hand, Close your chin. Um, practice that one too. Get them all talking, get them to do it. Get them to physicalize it in their body first. Those are some really good techniques I find for bringing the room back to quiet. All depends who you're working with. If you're working with like rowdy teenagers or like kids, um, there's a lot of other techniques that can work too. Um, yeah, that's, I've had some, I've had like rooms of like 30 boys and it's just like almost no matter what I do, everything I say, they're like, bah! <laughs> so sometimes the structure itself, sometimes just the dynamic, the fact that 30 boys are in a room, no matter how good of a facilitator I am, it's like, you're going to swim, you're going to be swimming upstream the whole time, you know? You might as well just like learn techniques that don't take much energy. Like sometimes I just stand there with complete, this is like assertiveness training, I just stand there with complete neutral body language and a neutral face. And I'll face you. And I'll just wait. And there's something really powerful about it. And like sometimes I'll look right at the people who are talking. <laughs> and like when they look at me, they're like, oh man, oh man, he's serious, he's serious, he's serious. And then like they'll stop talking. <laughs> and it's this really powerful technique. It's unbelievably strong. Um, sometimes I'll do that. Like I'd rather do that one if they're just gonna keep doing it. I'll do that one because it doesn't take energy, right? Yeah. Those are some questions. Those are some answers. Hopefully, one of those lands for you and you can use it. But know that sometimes this, the way that it's set up just is, isn't gonna work no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. So you have to change it. There's been times in workshops where I'm like, you know what? Let's split the group up. Like this just isn't gonna work. Okay, can you? I have another facilitator. Luckily, can you take that? And they, that one time, one time I did. I had to split the genders like between guys and girls, um, recognizing there are more genders than that. But we, we split the two genders in that context because it just wasn't safe for the girls in that context. Like the boys are being really harsh and not acknowledging the girl's experience um, of how it is to be a woman in, in life. So I just like made that call. Like no matter how I tried to facilitate it, it just was not working. So I was like, let's split it up. They left. Like sometimes you have to make those calls too. Yeah, hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> Maybe we could take one last question. We got five minutes. Um, oh, where did I go? One person wanted to know the difference between how you distinguish between participation and commitment. So in your in your mm. model earlier, I think like maybe you wanted to clarify how do we go from mm, that's a really good question participation participation to commitment. If I was in front of you, I would be like, "What do you think it means?" <laughs> It's a classic, classic thing. You just like turn the question around. What do you think? My, my, one of my mentors does that to me all the time and I'm like, sometimes it actually annoys me. Like I'll ask her advice, she'll be like, well, what would you say, Warren? We're like, I don't know, Peggy. What would you say? We're like say it back and forth to each other. Um, that's a really good question, actually. I don't commonly talk about that. I think for me, it's just off the cuff, Participation, like you might get someone to participate in an activity, but it doesn't mean they're going to stick for your whole workshop or your whole program. Mm -hmm. Like I see mostly with youth. Um, you see this, like when I, when, when someone comes to an indigenized workshop or a camp or any kind of, any kind of event and they, 
participate over and over again, and they see how amazing it is, you'll feel when they're committed. Like they'll, they'll anytime they hear about indigenized, they'll like show up for it. They just hear the name, they're like, oh man, I'm there. Do you know? That's like that's that's commitment. They like completely are convinced. They believe in the people and the bottle itself. Um, that to me is commitment. We're like they're willing to stretch for it. They're gonna they're gonna wake up early. They're gonna stay late. They're gonna do things. That's like the level that can come. Um, that most people probably don't really experience very often because you haven't learned a bunch of amazing techniques that work really well. I know when I was first facilitating, it was like brutal sometimes. Like I'd be pulling teeth, like trying to get people to talk. It was horrible. Or the opposite, kids would be flying off the Richter and I'd be like, I don't even know what to do. It's just like a deer caught in the headlight sometimes. Um, and that was all pre-learning a lot of these technical and creative techniques. Um, so if you notice that, you know, I didn't know how to work with people in so many dynamics. I was just lost. I just didn't know what to do and I would commonly feel embarrassed or I would just like shut down, like, uh, you know. Um, so I, I could not say enough that if you host events, if you lead meetings, if you lead workshops, um, camps, like learn these skills, just hands down. Find somewhere to learn skills. Even if it's not here, learn skills. <laughs> it's so helpful. It saves your life. <laughs> Makes it so much more enjoyable. We had we had one other really interesting question. I don't know if you don't mind taking one more. Yeah, uh, no. There was one person who was who was wondering because we heard a lot about youth. They they were wondering about elders and a couple other questions that could like, oh, how do you do this with adults who are in disagreement and who can't, you know, come to accept the agreements that are asked of them in the beginning or or in elders and it's a different uh, dynamic sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah. It's all the same techniques, you know? Like, okay, let's, let's save that for example. Like, I have a couple elders. I'll front, front loading is probably the most important thing you can learn to do. I'll say, like, look, like, some of you in this room are my elder. And I, like, have so much respect for that. And I also want to acknowledge, traditionally, I would follow anything you say. And today, it's going to be different. There's a different power dynamic. The fact that you've asked me to be your facilitator means that I have to hold some level of power and and in, in all honesty there's there's ways that I know I know facilitation better than you do like hands down like I've learned I've studied this craft just like how uh, a five-year-old can know how to use your iPad better than you you know they just know how to use it better so we have to acknowledge that that exists and for this to really work I need you to trust me I need you to trust the power that I'm holding today um, because if we all kind of get on board with it and we work together, we can actually experience the benefits of what this workshop could be. Now, I'll say, saying that, saying all of that is amazing, but I'm saying that and, I'm, and I completely mean it and I'm in integrity because I've actually learned all the skills that makes me capable. And if you haven't learned those skills, it can be trickier because you don't know all those little things that um, you know, relaxes someone. A lot of times, and any time someone's feeling resistance and they're not sure about you, the more skills you learn, the more they can like be like, okay, this person does get it. They do understand. Mm -hmm. but you know what? I can follow this person. I trust this person. A lot of that's going to be a reflection of how much you really know facilitation, how much you've learned the craft. I walk into rooms, I swear, I'm looking at faces and people are like, who is this little kid? Like, he's our facilitator, especially a couple years ago. I was even like much younger than I do now. I'm 32. And like I commonly get mistaken for like mid twenties, and like two years ago I got mistaken for like low twenties, sometimes even teens. Um, <laughs> like walking to walking into school in a hallway, and someone's like, "Are you supposed to be in class?" <laughs> <laughs> I graduated in two thousand four. <laughs> um, anyways, it's a tangent. So, yeah. So it's it's an interesting. Like I just named a really good technique to do to acknowledge all that, but if you. I can say that with confidence and conviction because I actually believe it and I know it's true. Where, yeah, it's, it's a tricky thing. It's complicated. Yeah. It's complicated. And um, each group has its own dynamics, right? Absolutely. This group of elders versus this group of elders will be completely different. There may be more humor in one room than in the other, more willingness to be flexible in different groups. It, it changes, right? Totally. You could even say, like, you know, Maybe there is some tension, and there's some, maybe there's some pre-existing dynamics amongst you that I don't know about. Mm -hmm. But what can we do to get the best out of this day? 
Someone's was just asking a really good question. Yeah. Like, it's in your group. They have the, you have to believe they're capable. If you set them up right, they're capable of doing great things and working through differences and working harmoniously and they're capable of it. You gotta really believe it. Um, and I think that's why the skills are so key because it, you start to use them and they start to work and then your belief gets stronger and then you use them even more and then they work even better and you're like, oh man, and it's just like your confidence goes up. So like, that's why facilitation is so key. It's so key. Definitely exciting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I come around? Hi, I'm back from the Voice of Goddess Cave. Um, I wanted to thank Warren for coming today. I think this was a really excellent session. We got a lot of really positive feedback throughout. Uh, feel free to keep it going. We, we enjoy uh, hearing from you and, and uh, how you experience the sessions. Um, we would love to invite you back, as a matter of fact. We wanted to do, uh, uh, to propose the topic of, uh, of uh, building uh, support networks uh, in communities, and, and we would love to have you back for that if you're interested. Uh, so thanks so much. Uh, and I wanted to just take a moment to uh, thank the people on the UBC, UBC Learning Circle team who have helped make this possible. Davina Ridley is over here uh, being fantastic and, and helping moderate questions and, and everything else. And uh, we have Stefan Mladenovic who came in earlier and helped us out. Javier Rivera is a work learning student who also does great work. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. I wanted also um, thank uh, David Anderson uh, at eHealth, uh, at the First Nations Health Authority, who uh, was coordinating uh, the uh, video conference participation. And um, I want to tell you about the, the next sessions that we're having on January 31st. Uh, we have the Huihua Library uh, doing community research and empowerment. Kim Lawson is doing that, and uh, we're very excited to have her. February 8th, we have What Does Reconciliation Mean to You by Cindy Charlie Boy. And on February 13th, Are You Prep Aired? Prepared. Prep Basics and Knowledge Dissemination with Harlan Pruden. So, again, thanks so much for joining us today. We hope to see you in the future sessions. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Does it immediately get cut off? Or? As soon as I go. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thank you for participating. Um, hope to see you in the path of indigenizing the future. Why? Lim-lim. <laughs>